Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Sentinel Events Initiative, Becoming a Demonstration Site Webinar. All of our lines are currently on mute mode, and for everyone's awareness, we are currently recording this webinar. Um, if you have a question for us during the presentation, you'll see a chat box on the right-hand side of the WebEx platform. Please submit your questions using that chat box, and we will plan to address your question following the president following the presentation. Um, if you have any technical issues, this is also the best way to reach us. So to start off this webinar, I would like to hand it over to Kathy. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Kathy Browning, a policy advisor for uh, your Justice Assistant. Um, and on behalf of BJA, I'd like to welcome you to the, to the webinar. Um, I will be joined by several of my colleagues on this webinar as we um, explain to you more about the um, initiative and uh, the, the demonstration project that um, we are working on. Uh, also with me on the federal side is Maureen McGuff uh, and Jim Doyle, and then also from the Quattrone Center, John Hallway, who is leading this effort um, for us. So um, we're, what we want to do with this webinar is, is give you an overview of, sort of, of you know, what the goals of the Sentinel Events Initiative are um, and how to apply to, the, um, uh, to be part of the demonstration project. Um, as Tanya mentioned, we are uh, recording this and we will also make this available on the website um, afterwards so that uh, you, you'll uh, have access to it um, afterwards as well. So. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk about what is a Sentinel event. Um, until recently, we haven't really used this term um, in a criminal justice context. Uh, so I want to be sure that we're clear of what we're talking about. Um, so so all of that is a negative, a significant ne negative outcome with multiple causes. So something bad happened, but it's not just one thing that caused it. Um, and uh, so and it signals an, an underlying weakness in the system. So one of the best ways to describe it is by an example is through the chal Challenger um, explosion. Um, we're, it wasn't just one thing that caused um, that, the, that event. Um, there were a number of things that went wrong, a number of um, uh, deviations from uh, normal practice. Um, any one of those things probably wouldn't have caused the, um, the, the explosion, but all of them kind of combined together. So we're kind of, we take, taking a systems approach, um, which is a little bit different from uh, the traditional way of looking at things that go wrong um, you know, within the criminal justice context and elsewhere of trying to um, identify just a single cause. So uh, some examples of what Sentinel events look like uh, in a criminal justice context. Um, you know, it can be a wide range of, of things, including uh, wrongful releases or wrongful convictions. These are things that um, everybody would agree uh, um, that we don't want to see them happen again. Um, and, uh, or that this is not the way the system is supposed to work or ideally would work. So um, could be, uh, um, the other thing that we want to look at are the um, near misses. So instead of just waiting until after something goes wrong, uh, we'd like to um, maybe look at things where we caught something just in time, So um, uh, which we refer to as the good catches. So, so again, this, these are, it can be a wide range. It can be overdoses. It can be... Um, a, a wide range of, of um, events uh, that would fall under this. At this point, I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Jim Doyle, um, to go into more details about technical event reviews and what they look like. Um, thanks, Kathy. One, this idea grows out of a sense that 
in criminal justice, we like the capacity that other systems have developed to deal with things when they go wrong and to learn from them. The bumper sticker version of this, if you were trying to explain it over a drink to a friend, might be to say, look at what the National Transportation Safety Board does after an airplane accident. But that bumper sticker doesn't quite capture what we're trying to do here. What the NTSB does is central, it's federal, it's technocratic, it operates through teams of experts in particular fields, and it hands down its lessons. It's very much worth doing. We'd sell for that, but we want to try to do something else, which is a little bit closer to the way medicine does it. In hospitals now, sentinel events are available to be reconsidered, to be reported to a central agency, and to be considered, not in the process of blaming and shaming that once uh, looked at uh, a surgical mistake or something like that, but in looking at things in a systems basis to understand why things went wrong from the perspective of everyone involved. So where at one time the uh, impulse might have been to uh, uh, blame the pilot when the plane crashes, or it might have been to blame the nurse who administers the overdose to the infant in the NICU, uh, now people understand that the last proximate human actor is not the complete answer to the question. And that, in fact, that person might have been set up to fail by other things in the design of the system or by the actions unintentional of other people in the system. Uh, another thing that's a little different about what we're trying to do here from uh, what happens with the NTSB and the typical hospital thing that you hear about is that we're not trying to limit this to, and in fact, there's a reason to think we're better off if we don't concentrate on big spectacular events that call for a Warren Commission or a 9-11 Commission kind of response, but to look at the sorts of things that happen a lot, that repeat frequently, that may or may not have a huge impact, but that we can learn from. It's developing that capacity to learn uh, that this is aimed at, but to learn on a local level where the local actors and particularly the people on the front lines are involved. This is not an example of a federal push down of a federal model that everyone has got to get on board with. This is an answer to a sort of felt need in criminal justice to be able to do these things locally with colleagues on the local level and stakeholders on the local level. Now, you, you can see in the criminal justice system beginnings of people moving in this direction. You can see here and there people will have, as in Milwaukee, a homicide review commission, which will take a public health approach to why did this happen? Why did this person die? What could we have done? Uh, what can we predict about what happened in the future? Many jurisdictions have elder abuse death review panels that will look at the re death of elders. Others have child review uh, panels that work at uh, child deaths. Occasionally, you'll run into a domestic violence review panel in a prosecutor's office. Opioid overdose fatality reviews happen. The police foundation uh, has set out on a pioneering law enforcement officer near-miss database where they look at situations where a law enforcement officer was uh, nearly badly hurt, uh, but something intervened, and they try to learn from those lessons. Police Foundation also has a project that deals with averted school shootings where a school shooting was uh, uh, held off in advance. At the bottom of all of this is this understanding that uh, stopping with the last proximate human actor uh, is not a bad place to stop. And all of these things have a common goal, which is to identify and learn from contributing factors, propose and implement system reforms uh, to prevent similar events from occurring in the future. And all of them uh, grow out of this basic sense of causation and how things happen. And this idea is that, for example, if you commit, convict the wrong man or you release the wrong man, you're in the same position as a hospital that operates on the wrong man. People study those events and they find not one big error by one bad actor, they find 17 small errors. They find those errors combining with weaknesses in the system, and they find that none of those errors by themselves would have been enough to create the event. 
that none of these independent slips or mistakes or omissions is independently sufficient, that you only have to see them together before you can see things happening. So what, what's aimed at in medicine now and in other industries who are focusing on safety is trying to put together a process which isn't just a checklist, it's a culture change so that you try to get everyone involved all of the time in taking care of safety. Everyone gets to do everything they can to try to help continuously to work with safety. It's very different from the usual thing we have right now, which is that, well, if there's no individual to blame for this police shooting, uh, then there's nothing to learn. What we think is that most events, there's something you can learn from, even when things turn out all right in the end, and the advantage of doing this on a non-blaming basis is it encourages everybody to come forward and take their part rather than uh, to run for cover every time something happens. Nobody really wants to get involved in an unpredictable disciplinary system where you or some uh, coworker is going to get punished or disciplined. People tend to bury uh, events that we could learn from when everything seems to be focused on blame. So we want to see if there's a way to change that on a local level. We want to think about trying to get all the stakeholders involved. And by all stakeholders, we particularly mean all ranks. In many ways, what's uncharacteristic about this Sentinel Event Initiative in criminal justice reform terms is that this is very much a bet on the people on the front lines, that they know a lot, that they should be treated as a resource in avoiding repetitions and not as a menace that just has to be disciplined and punished. We also think that there's an opportunity here because this is not part of the disciplinary process, but it's part of a learning process to involve people who aren't, aren't ordinarily players. That if you have, for example, a, a police shooting in a community, or you have a wrongful conviction in a community, or if a dangerous person is mistakenly released and hurts somebody, the tendency is to try to focus at first on one last human in the chain of events to decide whether that cop who pulled the trigger or that judge who signed the release order needs to be disciplined or punished or humiliated, and if not, uh, don't do anything. And what this leaves the community with is the impression that uh, if nobody's going to get hung, uh, well, then there's nothing to see here, move along. And what that does is create in communities, and in professional communities, the sense that you don't much care whether this happens again when there's no one to discipline or punish. So central events is meant to deal with the reality that whether or not you're going to hang someone for some event, there's still plenty left to learn. Even if someone is disciplined, you're going to have the questions of who hired this person, who supervised this person, who trained this person. How did this situation look to that person when they made this decision? The overall purpose of this is to mitigate the future risk and prevent having this error uh, recur again. So um, why use these things? Well, it's because this whole etiology, this whole understanding of causation, of how things happen, opens up lots of good things that you can do. If you look at even the most tragic events in hindsight and you ask yourself, uh, well, why did this person make that choice? Uh, the first thing you can say is, well, they made that choice because they didn't know what the result of that choice was going to be. Nobody sets out to uh, kill an innocent person. Nobody sets out to put a dangerous person on the street. Uh, all of these things are things that good faith uh, decisions are made about that need to be understood at the moment that they're made. And the central event reviews give us a chance to look at that, to begin to work towards a just culture where everybody is accepting their own individual responsibility for the collective outcome, where everybody understands the role that they're playing in contributing things, and everybody understands that they might be contributing to something, not just by making mistakes, but by not uh, seeing something, by not acting as well as by acting. Get to get at the question, why did person X zig when he or she should have zagged? Because if we don't do anything about the conditions and the understanding and the incentive of person X, and we just exercise person X, 
Well, that same situation is waiting around for person Y when he or she comes along, and we don't have any good reason to think that they're not going to make the same choice uh, if we don't put in the effort to understand it. So um, why do we do this? I think what, what can, this can do is provide an important complement to, not a substitute for disciplinary reviews, even in their cases where there are uh, misconduct involved. If misconduct occurs, yeah, it has to be, it has to be uh, addressed. No system, no department can live uh, without uh, disciplining its intentional rule breakers or the people who engage in reckless misconduct. That's not the point of this. This is not something to do instead of those investigations. This is something to do in addition to those investigations. We also can examine this conduct to better understand the background things, the hiring, the training, the supervision, um, the incentives, the things that made people do what they did that aren't covered in the rules. Uh, it lets us understand uh, what we all really understand if we've spent any time working in the system, that the work that has to be done isn't always exactly the same as the work that's laid out in advance in the rules and the checklists and the guidelines. And it gives us something important to say to the community that everyone in the system is working for. Whether we're going to discipline or prosecute someone or not, we as organizations and as professional leaders and professional actors are going to hold ourselves accountable for learning from this event so that it will never happen again. So um, what do you get out of it? Well, um, I, I think this is the point where I, I feel pretty confident turning this over to the imagination of the people who've been doing the work for a long time in various fields of policing, prosecuting, defending, forensics, uh, corrections, to say that this is all the kind of thing that we see every day. I, I, I personally am a longtime defense lawyer. I've spent a lot of time standing outside of courtrooms with crowds of people from the police and the prosecutors saying, how did that happen? And this gives us a way to start to think about how we can answer those things. To get an understanding not only of what we did that might have contributed to something, but what we did that affected or influenced the conduct of other stakeholders who are upstream and downstream from us, and will give them the reason to understand what's, uh, what they're doing and how it impacts our individual work in our specific location in the system. When you have a situation, for example, uh, like the one in Camden, New Jersey, where you have 67% of the emergency room patients also cycling through the criminal justice system in the same year, it starts to become almost silly to talk about one system being upstream or downstream of the other. They're simultaneously upstream and downstream of each other all the time. Everybody's work is affecting everybody else's work and there's really no good way to go about that without thinking of ourselves as all part of one system. And certainly from the perspective of the super utilizer uh, in terms of things like opioid abuse, in terms of things like uh, mental health, in terms of homelessness, in terms of all of the people who we see in the system all the time, uh, it looks like one system to them. And this will give us, if we can pull it off, a better understanding of not only how complying with rules can be important and how we can have better rules, but also an understanding of why the people's practices may have drifted away from those rules. How pressures in the environment created triage and covert work rules and local adjustments. How it is that workmanship required the rules to be changed. What questions should we be sending for empirical investigation? How can we learn from events? The, the key thought about this, that this gives us that we don't really have in criminal justice, is we have the capacity to do performance reviews by deciding whether we're going to discipline or demote, prosecute some individual operator in the system. What we tend not to do is an event review that helps us understand all of the various factors that influence the decision at the time. Factors that we can do something about so this doesn't happen again. 
And that's that's what we're hoping we can support local people tailoring to their local circumstances so that we can evaluate the outcomes. Thank you so much, Jim. Hi, everyone. This is Maureen McGough. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so we recognize that this absolutely has to be built on local innovation, but we also recognize that in many jurisdictions, this might be a pretty novel approach. So we just wanted to take a little bit of time and sort of outline the groundwork that we've done, the, the research and the investments that we've already made to build a strong foundation from which you can explore that, that local innovation. Um, so first and foremost, we were really lucky to have Jim Doyle with us for a couple of years in a visiting fellowship capacity. Um, while he was here, he did um, a lot of research writing, um, but most importantly, um, led the convening of stakeholder-specific roundtables. And basically, this was an effort to better understand perspectives, priorities, concerns, um, potential roles, and how it is that we should construct this framework in a way that will be most beneficial to criminal justice systems and the communities that they serve. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, different stakeholder groups that we spoke to and found particularly helpful in framing how we think about this. Um, one is the concept of persons harmed. So Jim touched on this um, a little bit, but what some Sentinel event reviews might do is, is provide a seat at the table for people like exonerees or crime victims, um, and, and not only that, but criminal justice practitioners who we might not necessarily think of as persons harmed in the first instance, but people who have played a role unintentionally in a Sentinel event outcome um, may sometimes bear a pretty significant burden from that, and, and we see this review process as an opportunity for them to be part of the solution in preventing reoccurrence. Um, we also had a really great discussion uh, with community representatives, uh, Jim touched on this as well, that depending on the case that you're looking at, um, a Sentinel event review might be a way to invite the community to the table, give them a seat, and give them an opportunity to co-produce the criminal justice that the system is trying to provide. Um, we also had an all stakeholders convening where we brought together representatives from all different aspects of the criminal justice system, including persons harmed and communities. Um, but we also got them in the same room with um, some folks from analogous industries and also brought in state legislators and, and mayors to really understand um, Sentinel Event Review's role in broader transformation at the jurisdictional level. Uh, in addition to that, we have had um, a host of thematic working groups. Um, we have a lot of publications in the space. Jim Doyle has been particularly prolific. Um, John Hallway, who you'll hear from shortly, has written a lot about this. And then through the National Institute of Justice, we've published um, several sort of uh, guiding documents that you'll see a little bit more about at the end of this presentation. And the National Institute of Justice, um, which is the DOJ's research agency, has also invested a fair amount in social science research in advance of this demonstration project. Um, so that is sort of localized projects to understand if Sentinel event reviews can be used in um, issues like reducing suicide and self-harm in jails or understanding investigative failures and wrongful convictions um, and failures in homicide reviews. Um, but perhaps most importantly, from your perspective, as you consider whether or not to apply to participate in the demonstration project, is the pilot site exploration that we had a couple of years ago. And there, our, our goal was actually pretty simple, and that was just to answer the question, can a Sentinel event review be done in an adversarial system like criminal justice? Um, and we went out into three different jurisdictions across the country. Um, the answer to that question was yes, um, it might be difficult, but it also is eminently worth trying and in many cases might be our best shot at sustainable system reform. Um, and actually, John Hallway, who I will be introducing shortly, um, led the Philadelphia Pilot Site Implementation Project. Um, so in addition, there's also the efforts that Jim mentioned earlier, like elder death reviews, that apply many of these same principles in the criminal justice context. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to John Hallway to discuss our national demonstration project and process evaluation. Um, we are extremely lucky to partner with the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice out of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So uh, John is the executive director, um, and he will be leading the training and technical assistance efforts, assistance efforts to support any of the sites that participate in this project. All yours, John. Thanks, Mo. Um, 
So just as a technical issue, we're doing this from different places and the screen's just left my slide. All right. I will control the slide for you. Just tell me when. Will do. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, John. So, as Maureen said, we're going to be working with participants in the demonstration project to um, carry out these technical event reviews, uh, and we can work with you from start to finish in the process. So from the discussion of um, what cases might be interesting to you in your jurisdiction all the way through to uh, generating recommendations, um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're working with the government and we're here to help. Um, <laughs> The idea is to have uh, as many as 15 sites in the next two years, uh, and we will bring resources to bear uh, to help create the teams, identify cases, uh, talk about how we would share documents. Um, in some circumstances, we've used confidentiality agreements. Um, in other circumstances, we've created uh, settings where people simply bring their documents into the room, the documents get used there without being shared, but the information so the information can be shared without the documents uh, being, being shared. Uh, and then people we'll take the documents and return back to uh, their respective offices. There's lots of different ways um, that we can set those up. Um, we also uh, and I'll, we'll show you a process for how we facilitate the reviews, how we gather data. Um, and identify what we call contributing factors. So um, in, in, sometimes sentinel event reviews have also been called root cause analyses, but often in the criminal justice system, what we see are not a single root cause, uh, but multiple contributions from all stakeholders, um, all of which come together to lead to the undesired outcome. What we wanna do is work backwards from the event and figure out what those contributing factors are um, and how to then, once we've identified the contributing factors, what what reforms, what improvements we can make to, the system to stop them. Uh, then we'll work with you to develop recommendations. Um, and what we hope to get from you, obviously, are um, something that helps uh, both you and the, and the rest of the group. But understanding your experiences, really this is a research project. Uh, where we want to do this in as many different settings uh, as possible, because that's really what's going to maximize our learnings about where these things work effectively, where they don't, and where we have to make certain tweaks. Um, our first site, for example, uh, is doing things looking at opioid-induced fatalities, and the structure is pretty unique to that given some of the public health document sharing challenges. Um, the, you know, we, we would invite you to be creative in terms of the cases that uh, are interesting to you, uh, because that's what's really going to help us learn how to more, most broadly apply uh, these principles. Next slide. Um, as Maureen said, we have a fair amount of experience in doing this. Uh, we got started with a project uh, in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, which is a suburban county here um, outside of Philadelphia where the Quattrone Center is based. Um, that uh, was, a, was a case in which a, a DA's office had brought charges in a sexual assault case that due to some errors in charging, they were forced to drop and uh, refer the case out to the attorney general's office. Uh, we went in to look at why uh, the, the prosecutor's office, despite its best intentions, had, uh, had had that challenge, wrote up a white paper on it that actually won an award, uh, and I think gave us enough credibility to uh, then participate in the Sentinel event pilot project uh, and create the, Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia event review team. Um, if you're interested and want to see what a final report could look like, uh, you can go on to the Quattrone Center's website and check the output tab. The very first two documents are the results of Sentinel event reviews we did, one in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia event review team, um, and one in Baltimore. In each of those situations, uh, we, because of the jurisdictions involved, we happen to be looking at um, inaccurate convictions. Uh, but as we've said, that's not uh, a limiting category of error. But we were able to bring together the prosecutors, the defense bar, uh, the police department, uh, and the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia, and working with all four agencies, uh, work together to look at these cases and understand, um, uh, oppor identify opportunities for improvement from each of those stakeholder groups and more that we thought would be useful in preventing errors going forward. 
Um, and uh, if you're interested, I think the participants in those would by and large be willing to talk to you uh, about their experiences and what they found useful and where there are areas for improvement that we'll be bringing uh, to this project as well. So if you, if you have those questions, please feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to uh, refer you so you can hear uh, some other people who have that experience as well. Next slide. Um, so, uh, generally what we found from the pilot project and what we have found since is that there's a real value when you bring the multiple stakeholders together, um, there's a real value to have a moderator who doesn't have a political stake in the outcome. I think um, the, the, the pilot projects that had that moderator were successful. Uh, the pilot projects that lack that moderator have a real challenge as far as um, how to share documents, how to talk to the actual event participants from the different uh, agencies who were involved, um, and really just how to set the stage of uh, objectivity and trust. Um, what we're really asking the organizations to do uh, is to step forward and understand why everybody involved did the things that they did. Uh, in an atmosphere where we're assuming that everybody's acting in good faith. And that's obviously sometimes a little bit easier said than done in a highly politicized and charged atmosphere like an event review. Um, and having that moderator in the center who can kind of remind everybody why we're here, uh, keep the eye on the, on the, on the greater good um, has been a useful thing. So what we'll do as we're preparing for this is we'll ask um, each jurisdiction to uh, identify one or more cases of interest, uh, and then identify the participating agencies who were involved in that case, uh, bring three or more of them, as many as possible, together to, um, to, to really look at the case and understand where each organization's participation and, you know, contributed, as we said, to the outcome. Um, and we will bring uh, both our expertise in doing the review, but also subject matter experts that are relevant to the case. So depending on the type of error, we might bring uh, different people. In the opioid-induced fatalities, we bring forward a sociologist and an epidemiologist to assist. In the wrongful conviction setting, we might bring a homicide detective from another jurisdiction, uh, a forensic analyst from another jurisdiction. All of those things will be case-specific, and we have a bullpen uh, of about 25 different subject matter experts uh, already who've agreed to participate, uh, and we can go out and get more depending on the, uh, on the particulars of the case or cases that, uh, that you'd like to bring forward. Next slide. Um, this is just a sample of the review process. Again, um, depending on the type of case, we can tailor the review process to fit um, uh, the needs of the specific case. But in essence, the first thing that we do is, is bring everybody together and set the stage and make sure everybody is in agreement uh, on the process. And I want to emphasize that, it, that this is the jurisdiction's process, not the Quattrone Centers. So this is a structure, um, but the deal here is, the idea here is to have a consensus-driven outcome where each organization is in agreement with those proposed system changes that fall within its purview. Um, so that the things that we're recommending are useful to you and implementable within your jurisdiction. So at the end of this, you know, the, the, we started in a way that we hope will lead to um, each participant being excited to implement the proposed changes because they've been involved in their creation and understand the rationale. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll ask each of the organizations that are involved to provide us with whatever documents or correspondence uh, might exist, whether that's uh, police reports or notes or emails or um, uh, court transcripts, whatever it might be. We gather those documents and we prepare a timeline that is as specific as we can be, because what we want to know is what the participants who are involved were thinking at the moment they made decisions. We want to avoid that hindsight bias of looking back on it and thinking we know the answer. And instead, we want to know why somebody who didn't know what the outcome was going to be thought that the things that they did were the best things for them to do at the time. So the way that we do that is first we create that timeline. Um, then we come back to the group and we say, based on the timeline, we think these are the people that we'd like to pr have provide that real-time, then-current information to the group. 
Uh, and we connect with those people with a combination of the Quattrone Center and subject matter experts. And so the idea is if we're interviewing a homicide detective, uh, we would bring a homicide detective from another jurisdiction to accompany us in that interview. Uh, and that way we ensure that people who have some domain knowledge are involved both to help us identify um, what the important issues are and so that the participant understands that this is not a gotcha exercise. This is something where we're trying to learn from them about the things that were influencing their decision making so that we can put them in a better, uh, a, an area where they are more likely to, to reach the success that they want uh, in, in subsequent incidents. Um, we'll bring those interviews together, we'll synthesize and analyze them, and we'll come to the group with a, with a, with a group of problem statements or contributing factors. These are the things that we think led to the bad outcome. We'll discuss that with the group and reach consensus on what contributing factors we think really are there and which ones we want to uh, respond to. Um, and then we'll take that back and we'll come up with draft uh, potential interventions or, or improvements to the system. And then again, we'll bring that to the group and get consensus on all of those. Um, and, and, you know, it's important to understand that this is designed to ultimately be an iterative process. So we have yet to do a review where we were able to meet every uh, participant. Uh, it's been a voluntary process and not everybody has wanted to participate. Um, we've brought forward uh, proposed thoughts for improvements that the group has not wanted to use or that have not been unanimous. And those uh, proposals simply haven't been included in the report. Um, this doesn't have to be perfect and we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Um, despite you know, not having everybody uh, participate, we've always had really positive learnings and, and have always felt that the ball has moved forward uh, and we're confident that will happen with your jurisdiction too. Um, once we have agreed on those uh, desired uh, improvements to the system, uh, they get handed off and assigned to individual agencies to implement. Uh, the Quattron Center would work with the group on generating a consensus report um, without uh, naming a lot of names or, or, or you know, the, the learnings that we get are going to be de-identified, and, and that's part of why I direct you to the reports that are published on our website, is to give you some sense of, of what that looks like. Uh, and then we'll work with you to circle back at some future point in time uh, to see what your thoughts are on how useful the process has been, and hopefully then to set this up so that it's a recurring thing that you guys do in your jurisdictions um, as a regular part of your quality process to generate that feedback loop for continuous improvement. Next slide. Uh, so information on how to apply is here and I'll turn it back to my colleagues at BJA for more. Okay, thanks. John, um, so I'm just going to summarize a, a lot of what's been covered um, in this webinar. Um, so uh, we tried to make um, the application process as straightforward and simple as possible. Um, we created a, a website which is included on this slide here, the BJA SEI uh, website, I mean the um, email. Uh, that you can use to submit your materials uh, for uh, or your application material. Um, and at this point, we're planning to, to review these on a rolling basis um, as they come in. Um, as so, uh, just to summarize some of what John covered, um, we want a, a brief summary of the event um, that your jurisdiction would like to review. And by brief summary, I'm talking, you know, two, three pages. Um, that would include a description of the event, um, a description of any open litigation related to the event, um, a, an overview of how you identified the uh, partners um, that uh, were identified as being part of the event, um, and any insights that you might have just up front about um, what kinds of challenges there may be. Um, that's not a, a reason not to apply if, if you're not sure. Um, you know, feel free to uh, you know, put in an application. We're happy to talk to you and, and kind of figure out you know, uh, if those challenges are ones that we've seen before and, and you know, what our sense is of whether they can be overcome. Um, as John said, you know, through the experience, we, we dealt with, deal, with situations dealing with um, confidentiality issues and things like that. 
Um, we also, uh, in your package, should include a letter of support um, from each of the three or more agencies who are going to participate. So, again, there's, we're asking that you have at least three stakeholders um, at the table here. So, um, and, and it could be a wide range, so police, community, and, and prosecutors. Um, ideally, it would be helpful in most circumstances to have more than three. Um, but three is at least uh, kind of the minimum what we're looking for. So we want a letter of support from each agency who, who is agreeing to, um, to uh, participate in this. Uh, also, a list of key team members um, with you know, details about who they are and, and um, uh, representing uh, the stakeholder group. Um, also, you should identify one person who will be sort of the primary point of contact for us in going forward. Um, we have set up a website, uh, which is also on this um, slide. Uh, that provides a lot more information uh, beyond what we covered today. Next slide. And speaking of resources, we we referenced some of these along the way. Um, so, in addition to our website, which I would encourage everybody to go to um, to to learn more about the the work that we've done in the past um, and uh, what you need to do to apply. Um, Maureen made reference to some publications that are um, linked to, I believe, on our website, but they're also on the NIJ website. Um, Mending Justice Paving the Way is the document that came out of the lessons learned from the, um, from the pilot sites, the three pilot sites. Um, so it's a really good resource um, if you're thinking about this uh, to, to kind of look at that. Um, uh, there are also some podcasts that are available, the information is there. And then we've included the contact information here from uh, all of the today's speakers. Um, you're welcome to uh, email any of us to uh, get if you have any questions um, to, uh, before submitting an application. Um, at this point, I think that uh, concludes uh, the presentation portion here, so I guess I'll turn it over to you, Tanya. To yes. So thank you to Kathy, Maureen, Jim, and John for an informative presentation. We've now reached the Q&A session of our webinar. Um, we will continue to keep our lines on mute mode at this time, but we encourage everyone who has a question uh, to please use the chat box on the right-hand side of the WebEx platform and submit your questions to us. We will do our best to address them, um, and we will also read them off and answer them as they come in. So we will give everyone a moment or two, a minute or two, um, to take some time to send in your questions.
Hello, everyone. It looks like we have a few questions um, that just came in. And so what we'll do is we'll read them out loud and we'll see the team here can answer them. The first question that came in is, in cases where there is potential civil or criminal liability for the actors involved, such as a police, police shooting or a Brady violation for an ADA, are there concerns that the Sentinel Events Review participants could be hit with subpoenas or called to testify in any pending or future proceedings? So I think that's probably a perfect uh, question to uh, go to John. John, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, I, I guess the easiest way to answer the question is to say that um, we would take the position if such a thing were to happen, that this is research that goes through an ethics board review, uh, and it would be contrary to the uh, purposes of the research to disclose that information or to force its disclosure. Um, the Brady situation um, is an interesting one because, of course, the prosecutors have absolute immunity there. So it's uncertain to me how a lawsuit would proceed to, to get to that point. Um, but I guess it is theoretically possible that there could be a subpoena. Um, and it is theoretically possible that, that subpoena could be, um, uh, could, could be granted. Um, we would object to the subpoena and see what happens. Uh, but of course we can't prevent anybody from filing a suit or, or whatnot. Um, but typically, we do operate with confidentiality agreements. We do operate with the um, Ethics Bureau, uh, uh, the Ethics Review Board uh, protections as well. Um, and, you know, I guess we would also hope that since this is, uh, you know, not a gotcha sort of deposition or exercise, that anybody would say the same thing to us that they would say in that sort of setting in any event. Thank you, John. I do see another question that has just come in. The question is, is there an ideal time frame as to how recent an event should have occurred to perform a Sentinel event review? Okay, uh, so this is Kathy and I will start off, but I have my colleagues weigh in um, on this as well. Um, we've actually, uh, in the pilot program, so we've, uh, looked at a range of um, events. Some of them have been more recent, some of them have been older, um, and it seems that the process works. There's some trade-offs uh, with both. Um, some of the older events, sometimes you uh, can't, don't have access to as many of the people involved, but yet sometimes the information you have is much richer. Um, but, uh, you know, and, but, but it, it still can be a very valuable thing. So. Um, there's not, in my mind, uh, a preference for one or the other, although I think it's sort of geared towards a more recent events as part of this continuous learning, but, um, but uh, I, so there's no particular time frame. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Um, these, these last two questions both give us an opportunity to emphasize the fact that this is really not a program where the feds are making everybody check the boxes. That what people learn from working around these kinds of issues in local sites is an important part of what we hope to learn by trying this out. Um, so, for example, uh, in the first situation, well, uh, do, you, do you need to have the particular assistant district attorney who might have been involved in the Brady violation, or do you need to have the perspective of a person in that position? Can you substitute perspectives for people? Or can you choose events where anything that has to be paid out has already been paid out so that you have a set cost that's already been assumed and you might as well learn the lessons that you paid for? Um, that's also true in terms of the timing, obviously. Uh, there are advantages to taking brand new events because there are recent things going on, but in the uh, group of pilot site events that have been done and that Quattrona has been done, it's remarkable how much you can learn from very old events. But again, in saying all of these things, I'm trying to avoid being prescriptive about it. That's something to work on. That's something where everyone, at least I'm stressing, should be learning from the people on the front lines who are engaging in this process. 
The answers to that question and those questions are something that uh, the participants know a lot about and that learning from those participants is one of the aims of this initiative. Thank you, Jim. That's a great reminder. So we still have time to uh, receive a few more questions. So please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen and please submit the questions and we will do our best to answer them. We'll give it a moment to give everyone a chance to submit their questions. We just received another question. This one is, are there any regional or size requirements or preferences with regard to the municipalities or agencies you hope to work with? This is Kathy and I'll take this one. Again, my colleagues can join, uh, add to what I say. Um, so uh, now, um, the, we are open. We, we have every reason to believe that this process can work um, in any size jurisdiction. Um, there may be some challenges uh, you know, that are different in the different um, uh, size areas, but um, you know, pointing back to what Jim just said, um, we, we want to learn about uh, how this works. So um, there is uh, no particular preference on our end in terms of uh, size or the type of jurisdiction that applies. In, in fact, I think if, if there is a preference in this initiative, it's to have a distribution of different sizes and different places yeah. and to see what can be learned from those particular environments. So, for example, um, many events will happen in smaller jurisdictions with smaller departments. If an event review done there convinces people that it's a good thing to do, then the question is, well, can we organize a regional basis for doing this? Or can we organize a state organization with perhaps a confidentiality safe harbor that smaller jurisdictions could draw on? Uh, all of these things are things that we would learn from every jurisdiction. If, there, if there's one thing that everybody involved with this uh, fervently believes is that this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of endeavor. Uh, that people really want to learn about variation and variety. Thank you. All right, we still have some time for a few more questions. So please submit your questions in our in the chat box and uh, we hope to address them. We will give everyone a minute or two to submit their questions. All right, I see another question here. So this is a follow-up question. Is there a severity of undesired outcome that is preferred as a subject of review, as opposed to an officer-involved shooting or false conviction, perhaps a minor traffic accident or other relatively minor outcomes is still appropriate? One of the key findings of people in aviation, uh, for example, and John can speak to this too, is that they learn the most from high-frequency, low-impact events. Uh, and that's why I was stressing at the beginning that although it's easy to get people's attention with the big, tragic Warren Commission, 9-11 Commission sorts of events where the newspapers are howling for uh, transparency and exposure, 
a lot of learning happens in small, repetitive things, and so we would very much welcome um, people applying to deal with events like that. Um, and one other thing to mention is that our view of this is not to, not to get people to try one-off fix-its because the lesson from the safety world is nothing you fix really stays fixed. We want this to be an ongoing practice that people begin to make a routine of. And so in many ways, uh, smaller, less spectacular events where, for example, maybe the police officer almost shot but didn't um, can be very, very informative and uh, very good uh, events for us to do an event review of. Thank you, Jim. So we still have a few more minutes. We can probably take one more question and uh, we'll be on the line and we'll, um, if you still have a question, feel free to send it to us. Well, it looks like we have no questions, but um, as you see here in the last slide of our presentation, you do have the contact information for all of our panelists today. We want to wrap up and thank all of our panelists, Kathy, Maureen, Jim, and John for joining us. And so we, this concludes the end of our webinar presentation. We appreciate everyone who dialed in and joined us in the WebEx. And um, we plan to send a follow-up email with a copy of the presentation from today's webinar. So please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.